These apparently never-ending lines of cars waiting for a refill are reminiscent of the gas crisis in the early 70s. However, these aren't gas-powered cars, but as you can see, they're all electric vehicles waiting to get onto a charger. Long queues for public chargers have become a common sight in urban areas of the United States, particularly in California, and legislation to stop using internal combustion engines could only make matters worse. The vehicle target uh, and the mandate that we have here in the state and which about a dozen, I think 11 or 12 other states throughout the US have adopted is to phase out the sale of new internal combustion engine vehicles by 2035. It seems like it's a very reasonable pathway. Some would say it's perhaps uh, not quite aggressive enough. And of course, the rest of the country is not on that same timeline. So we have a bit of a mismatch in terms of how quickly we're going to reduce our transportation emissions around the US. But that target seems very ambitious, but very achievable. It's estimated that in California alone, a million public charges will be needed by 2030, 10 times the number already in use. To meet that target, about 130,000 new charges will have to be installed yearly, seven times the current build rate. And with the cost of a fast charger approaching $200,000, the investment is close to $35 billion a year. And once those 15 million electric vehicles are on the road in 2035, you can double the number of public chargers needed. This may seem to be unattainable, but Ted Lam thinks otherwise. I think it's achievable for two reasons. One is the way that people consume fuel and the way that people charge their vehicles and the way people expect to charge their vehicles is going to continue to change over time as more and more people adapt to what it means to have an electric vehicle. And the notion that you don't need to fill up every time you, uh, you charge, that you don't need to go off site to, to charge. Uh, many people, people with driveways, people with, uh, with private garages will be able to charge at home and will not have a tremendous need for publicly accessible charging. Others, uh, people who live in apartment buildings, people who don't have the capital to invest in a charger will need that publicly accessible charging. Um, I think that over the course of a decade, we will really refine our understanding of exactly who needs charging, who needs public charging, and who needs it where and when, how many different uh, vehicles, how many people can share a public charging unit. Um, and we're really just at the beginning of understanding what that network needs to look like. My concern or the, the question that I'm hoping we can address is that the, those chargers are distributed uh, and they are paid for in ways that the people who need them most can access them. Um, so that we don't end up in a situation where there's a lot of publicly accessible, expensive charging in rich communities, and there's very little publicly accessible charging um, in communities that actually need it in poorer and denser areas where people do not have their own chargers. The reason why it's doable is the way most people use their vehicles, whether it is in the US, Europe, or anywhere else in the world. The vast majority of vehicle use and the vast majority of trips are short. Over two thirds of trips or over three quarters of trips are, are less than 40 miles. Um, people are not driving long distances that will really tax the battery uh, capacity with much frequency. That's something that most people do, most people, you know, a couple times a month, a couple times a year. For long road trips using electric vehicles in the United States, for example, the federal government is funding charging stations along the interstate highway system. However, there is also a social aspect. At a fast charger, if you have a full battery and you want to get to enough of a, enough of a charge that you can complete your trip with an extra 100, 150 miles of length, you're going to need to stop for 10, 15, 20 minutes. And that is a cultural thing. And people are going to get used to it because uh, vehicle manufacturers are going to make electric vehicles and people will see all the benefits that they have. Um, the massively increased convenience, you know, 29 days out of the month, traded off for the slight uh, decrease in convenience that one time you make that long trip. The, the idea of sort of carrying your laptop to and from the office is something that 30 years ago maybe would, would really strike people as quite odd uh, that you'd carry your work machine to and from and now it's seen as very convenient and quite common. Um, I think it's in that kind of department. Um, so as long as the, the national entities are willing to fund those, you know, frankly, somewhat uh, uh, odd intervals of, of charging along the highway corridors, I think it's something people are just gonna get accustomed to and see the benefits in the other parts of life. We've all got used to driving in our cars, which is unsurprising as they have been around for a century. 
Over time, the infrastructure grew to support them. It's not as though every single person had an internal combustion engine once when the Model T was released. It took decades and decades and decades for that technology to become popular and for all the support infrastructure, fueling stations, dealers, uh, you know, all the different sorts of elements of that economy to grow up with it. That is exactly what we're trying to replicate here with the state driving the technology transition. And so it is a massive uh, cultural and economic shift. Even the idea of shifting away from the fueling station model, uh, you know, which is obviously having uh, infrastructure that pumps uh, uh, petroleum out of, the, out, of, out of a storage tank in the ground, puts it in your car so you can burn it and then pollute the atmosphere is not a social good and we shouldn't keep doing that. Currently, filling stations and charging stations, although they do the same job of fueling a vehicle, do it in subtly different ways. Beneath a filling station is a large holding tank for the fuel. This is topped up regularly by mobile tankers carrying as much as 40,000 liters. Each of the gas pumps has a separate feed from the tank. So if one vehicle is being filled or all the pumps are occupied, they are all filled at the same rate. That means cars and trucks can fill up as quickly as the pumps can pump. However, nowadays it's generally not the same with electric vehicle charging stations. A charging station has a fixed maximum power supply. For example, let's say a charging station has 10 charges and a supply of 1 megawatt. If there is only one car charging, all the power is available to the one vehicle. If two vehicles are charging, half the power is available. And if all 10 charges are being used, only 100 kilowatts are available for each car. With many vehicles trying to charge simultaneously, power must be shared equally. In turn, that means the time it takes to charge each vehicle goes up, so there is often the need to queue. This is partly a consequence of the rush to get the bare bones of a charging network in place to attract consumers to electric vehicles. But things are changing, at least in Europe. You probably have to start what was the historic process of installing charging stations in the, in the past couple of years. So it was all about speed, right? There was still sufficient grid capacity, so you could have access to the grid capacity. There was still sufficient pieces of land, greenfield, brownfield as well. It wasn't about more or less efficient scaling, but it was really about speed to just install the hardware as fast as possible. And this obviously changed, right? So we hit we hit quite strong times where the grid is more and more occupied, where, where the grid across Europe is more and more congested, and you have to scale charging infrastructure efficiently because otherwise the grid, uh, the grid operator will not grant you the access to the grid capacity, and you can only receive these accesses to grid capacity if you can use the flexibility and the capacity in a smart way. So it's from stupid chargers, to, to put it really bluntly, into smart charging, and that's the transition where the entire European charging infrastructure is is quite heavily occupied in, at the current time being. The rush to install electric vehicle chargers has become a headache for grid operators as the power demand has grown. However, demand-side flexibility is coming into its own. Software interaction between power providers and consumers reduces the need for capital expenditure. Demand can also, also follow production, which is especially the production from wind and sun. When we say, okay, we only consume electricity or we increase the, the consumption of electricity when we have sufficient sun and wind. But this is also not really easy when you say we speak about fast charging, right? Because the fast charging customer simply wants to plug in his or her car and wants to charge as fast as possible. So here we need to be even in a second level smartness, so to say. And here we also take into account the uh, existing capacity constraints of the grid. So here it's then all about saying, okay, when the crit is coming to its limits, from to its hardware limits, the crit operator also needs to be able to send control signals to the charge point operators, to the home chargers, to the home storage batteries, to the crit storage batteries, to the heat pumps, to also reduce and increase the consumption, not only when the production is there, but also when the transmission across the crits is possible, right? So how does this work in practice? If we speak about home charging, the home charging user plugs in his car at 6 p.m. and needs to drive to his place of work next day at 6 a.m. for 30, 30 
minutes maybe that's a huge potential flexibility where you can say how and where and when to charge his or her car so you simply say okay when electricity prices are cheap because we have a lot of wind and blowing through the wind turbines you should charge your car that's an implicit incentive through the, um, through the price of electricity you can also say you as a homeowner you can participate in explicit flexi flexibility schemes which is where you say hey you as a grid operator when you say my grid is currently really tight at flexibility you can reduce m my charging power because you say we cannot support the charging right now but we can support it in two and a half hours and i as an end customer i don't care if i charge my car at 2 a.m or at 3 30 a.m just postpone the, the charging process right so here i as an end user i can happily support all the different optimization schemes on price level on crit level without any negative impact or any impact in, at all on my end user convenience right However, for public charging stations, the situation becomes more complex. Here, the charging speed is critical, and operators will need to provide a buffer to ensure fast charging, no matter the grid capacity. As the operator of the charging park, you need to be the one who provides the flexibility without impacting the charging experience and the charging time of the end user, which is typically then done by additional storage batteries um, who are installed at the sites. And this will then be the future of charging. Um, as of today, it's more when we say, okay, the simultaneity factor of charging is not so high, right? So you have a grid capacity of, let's say, 1,500 kilowatt, and we install 10 charges each with 150 kilowatt. And we seldomly have a simultaneity factor which will get even close to one. So you can simply say, of course, they can all charge and we can even install 15 or 20 chargers because they are not all occupied, but still each customer gets the full throttle of charge. But the higher the simultaneity factor and the more tight the capacity in the grid will be, storage batteries will become essential to ensure the end customer convenience, but still flexibility towards the grid and towards the price of electricity. Using batteries will ensure fast charging on demand, but currently it's in its infancy. If you probably have a check across the entire European charging infrastructure, you will find maybe a handful of sites with, which already have a really significant size of a storage barrier. Of course, there are small ones which are being tested in more or less proof of concept phases. Um, but significant sizes of storage batteries which are really having an impact on price and customer convenience and the grid support those are really sand, seldom, but they are all being explored by every single charge point operator across Europe, right? So Tesla in Germany and Central Europe, Fastnet, Allego, a couple of other ones, also the first um, oil and gas companies who are also exploring the charge point operation business. They are all starting to, to test um, storage batteries because they see the future in it and they need to start exploring the product today to be able to um, effectively install and deploy it in a couple of years. If we don't count pickup trucks or SUVs, Tesla is the biggest selling car in the United States and Europe, with an estimated 700,000 Model Ys sold in 2023. Counting other Tesla models and electric vehicles being sold by different manufacturers, the need to be regularly charged undoubtedly puts an additional strain on any country's power generation capacity. If you think about where, where Tesla and their network and the popularity of their vehicles were 10 years ago versus now, at least in the US, uh, 10 years from now with many major manufacturers competing in this space and knowing that they want to sell these vehicles and they need to help figure out how to get them fueled, I just think that it's going to be massively improved. And yeah, there will be a number of stations that were installed either in the wrong location or a place where there really is no need for public access and those going to disrepair and it's inefficient bad use of funds but that's also part of the you know the growth of the of the of the program and it's it's not that dissimilar to a closed down gas station sometimes uh, a business doesn't work out and it closes and people go get their gas elsewhere and we will we'll, we will go through that same process with uh with EVs and charging. Let's keep in mind, the sophisticated infrastructure we know today for the internal combustion engine took more than a century to evolve. 
We're trying to replicate something similar for electric cars in just a couple of decades because of the urgency to get close to meeting the mandated reductions in global carbon emissions. Remember to hit the subscribe button and ring that bell to stay updated with our latest content. And while you're here, why not check out another one of our exciting videos? Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.